I just felt so defeated. I felt as if, like, here I am now. By that time, I was 24 because I turned 21 the next month after we got married. And I'm thinking, I'm 24. I'm damaged goods, you know. And the first night after I had left for good this time, I slept in my car. And I remember telling God, saying, God, I just can't do it anymore. But God kept me, and it was hard, you know. It, it was going to be hard to stay, and it was going to be hard to leave. So sometimes you're faced with two hard decisions, and wisdom is which heart is going to lead to life. This is CIA, Contagious Influencers of America. I'm David Sams. Boy, we have a great podcast today because we have a multi-award winning artist, speaker, author, and very brave woman. And I say that because she is actually our first guest here in the studio at the homestead. Well, since this coronavirus thing took over the world a couple of months ago, Nicole C. Mullen is our guest. She is uh, one of my favorite artists, actually. I'm, I'm sure you recall her big, big, big song, Redeemer, which uh, ironically came out like a couple of decades ago. And as a result, she has taken the time to write a book. And I want to tell you, this is a very authentic, personal book. And it deals with some issues that are somewhat uncomfortable to talk about at times especially if you are in a relationship or have dealt with um, domestic violence, uh, abuse, uh, you're going to hear Nicole talk about her personal story today, and, and she does get very personal. The book is called My Redeemer Lives. It's personal, a story of hope for our time. Nicole C. Mullen is my guest here on Contagious Influencers of America. Well, I, I want you to know you're my guinea pig. You're, <laughs> you're, you're my first live in studio interview in two months. Wow, well, you <laughs> You're the brave one. <laughs> I know. You know what? We actually had to take a lot of bravery and go to Dallas um, a week or so ago. Yeah, last week. Just so you know, we had to mask up, glove up, went to Daystar, was, yeah, did the same. Like, all right, Lord, here we go. <laughs> and so far, so great. So we're good. Yeah. How, how many people were on the plane? Um, you know, it wasn't a lot. I mean, uh -huh. there were, well, no, it wasn't like crowded or anything. It was, it was probably half full, maybe. Yeah. So what has this all been like for you going through this? We're going to talk about your book in a minute because yeah. there's nothing like coming out with a book in the middle of uh, quarantine, being locked down, right? <laughs> Globally. <Yeah. laughs> well, you know, it's been good, actually. It's been, you know, part of it, although um, I do understand the severity. Um, on the other hand, I'm always asking God, like, what are you doing? And what is what are we supposed to be doing as a result? And so for me, it's been a lot of soul searching. It's been a lot of uh, communing with God, even in unorthodox ways, like you're saying, whether it's me gardening or people taking walks or um, searching out scripture or just loving on your neighbor in a new type of a way, you know. And so for me, it's actually been good. I think it's kind of been a introvert's dream. Um, <laughs> did I say that? <laughs> but um, and, and at the same time, I'm praying for other people because I do understand, like I said, what's the, you know, the severity of what is going on but um i also think it's a reset situation it's a time for us to stop and to assess how we have been doing life and to um reset the things that should be in order that have been out of order in our lives and so i'm trying to take advantage of that in that way as well i'm amazed as i walk around the neighborhood here I've mapped it out. My neighborhood is exactly 3.1 miles. So I know where the one mile mark, the two mile mark, since wow. I'm doing all this walking. But, oh my gosh, there are people on the front porch for the first time. Yeah. I've lived here for six years in this yeah. neighborhood. I thought I was the only one that sat on my front porch. Wow. Now I go by at night and there's a dozen, maybe 18 people sitting on the front porch. There are these families walking around. There's, there's, uh, I've seen a dad with his two kids playing catch in the in the street yeah, yeah i mean i used to do that when i was like 10 yeah same here back in the day yeah <laughs> skating up and down the street yeah <laughs> that's great 
I know you're from Cincinnati. Yes. Are you a Buckeye fan? Yeah, because my well, dad was. I you, mean, like you better ish, be because I am. Oh yeah, of course I am. Yeah, that's what I meant to say. <laughs> but yes, I am. I'm born and raised there. But you know, like what you were saying earlier, I think people are craving community, and I think we have been lulled to sleep in certain areas of our lives by social media, by our phones, by um, being connected in a disconnected way, and now that that is uh, our only option. I think now we're craving the real again. We're craving community. We're craving, you know, to be able to see our neighbors. And we're loving the beauty of, like you're saying, riding bikes in the street, throwing footballs and Frisbees, you know, and um, being able to look forward to the day when we're able to actually get together again in ways that we should have been getting together prior to. So what has it been like for you? I know for me, I mean, uh, you know, I, I live here by myself. Mm -hmm. And it's, well, I have a cat. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Denise comes in and she's worked with me for 20 years. And, you know, I see her each day for a few minutes. But we, we social distance. I, wow. I don't I don't get within. Really? Like you and I are like eight feet apart yeah. right now. Uh -huh. right? At least. <laughs> I, I yeah. do the same thing. Wow. Right? Mm -hmm. I've, re I've respected that. And as, as has she. I mean, I've done a couple of Costco runs. Mm -hmm. I've done the, the Publix run, yeah. you know. Yeah. But that's about it. <laughs> yeah. But you know, like, I know that there's a controversy, even among the medical field of, and I know this isn't what this is about, this interview. However, I wanted to say this, that the downside of us being isolated from each other is that instead of our immune systems being built up as they were when we were around each other, um, it's, it's now in a place where it, it can be weakened. And so we have to make sure that we are doing our best to stay on the offense and we are taking our vitamins and we are, you know, doing things that are going to boost that because we don't want to be weakened when we are reintroduced to society either. So I think there has to be a happy medium. I think, mm -hmm. I think extremes on either side can be dangerous. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I just really, and like the Bible says, avoid all extremes. And I think this is a situation for that too. And so my prayer is that we would walk wisely, um, but at the same time, we would not be uh, paralyzed as a society by fear because fear really does have torment. It has a thing that says, I'm going to keep you all apart. And that's the very thing that God said, you know, the, the long term, it's not good for man to be alone. You know, so we do need each other, but at the same time, we have to be wise. So we are social distancing. I get that, but I pray that we don't do that emotionally. And, well, I, yeah. I, I agree it's good for yeah. man not to be alone, but Match.com doesn't really work right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it doesn't? Well, no. <laughs> but Zoom, Zoom's good. True, 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 true. <laughs> so, so how do you hope to come out of this on the other side? What, what, will, what do you hope to have learned? Um, I really hope to uh, have learned that um, God is more than enough and that people are priceless and we need each other and that we can develop things in the dark and in isolation that can still benefit us when the light comes back on and we're able to reintroduce ourselves to reacclimate ourselves to the greater populace. And so for me, I've been working on my art, working on books, working on um, music, working on just different ideas and things that I feel like are uh, creative flowers that I can cultivate during this season that I can still showcase even when the season is over. And so it's just a time of, of I think, just not just me, but us being intentional about using it and making the most of it while we have it. So let's talk about your book because uh, it, it's uh, very uh, personal. It is. My Redeemer Lives, it's personal. Yes, it is. It's personal. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I understand that it took you quite some time to write this. Was it just, yeah. the, 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 was it about the courage or finding the right words or the right timing? What was it? Why did it take several years to write this book? I think D, all of the above, really. It was the timing. It was the uh, seasons of life that I was writing in and writing about. It was revisiting different doors and different rooms of my past. And uh, although my story is my story, I think there's always an appointed time to showcase and to share certain things. And uh, I didn't plan for it to come out during the quarantine. That was not my initial plan. And I had been writing it for the past five years. However, I did want to capitalize on the fact that um, my Redeemer, my Redeemer Lives, the song that I wrote, 
and that came out 20 years ago. I wanted to capitalize on the fact that this was its anniversary. And in light of that, you know, here's the book, here's the story behind the song. And the story behind the song is also a part of my story. And so I just thought it was time to share it and to give hope. And, you know, we need hope right now more than we've ever need hope, needed hope before. And so I wanted to be a conduit of that and to say, hey, I'm adding my story to the pot and hopefully it'll cheer someone, it'll encourage someone and it will allow them to grab a hold of the ultimate hope and that is Jesus Christ. Give me the elevator pitch version of the story. I know you don't want to give away the book. Ha! <laughs> Nobody wants to yeah. give away their book, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. It, it really is a story of hope for our times. It is uh, how God has walked with me through heartache, through um, domestic violence, through uh, the, just the darkest nights. And he has shown his light, you know, and he has shown up in great ways and proved again that light dispels darkness regardless of what the details are. And so it is my testimony, it is my uh, me waving, me raising my hand saying, hey, I've gone through some things, but I've seen that God's love is greater than even the things I've gone through. And I've come out being able to say, I can help somebody else come out as well. Can you imagine going through this lockdown and quarantine with with a wrong uh, in the wrong relationship? Oh, I, I, I can only imagine the, the amount of yeah. domestic violence that yes. has occurred over the past two three months. Oh, Dave, I thank God all the time. I'm not, and I'm not saying this as a slight to anyone, but I am always saying, "Lord, thank you." Like just thank you, because even His no can be trusted. Even when He closes a door, and sometimes it breaks our hearts, and we don't understand, but it can be trusted because in hindsight, oftentimes we look back saying, I don't know what I would do if, you know, had you it had it been a yes still, you know, and that door hadn't closed and that situation hadn't gone awry. And I think something in scripture says to, you know, I think it was David who said it was good for me that I was afflicted. So sometimes the afflictions that we have, even though they don't feel good, they're not good in that season. I think they can still be used for good. In a later season and so I've, I've I'm experiencing that and that has no slight on anyone else um, and this book is not about those who've necessarily done me wrong even though you will hear that but it's not about them it's not me taking stabs or jabs it's me saying no these are my mistakes that I've made these are the heartaches that I have had these are the dark nights that I've experienced where I you know even some of them like God, take me home. You know, I know what it's like to be at the bottom and not want you not wanting to live anymore. I felt that. And I know what it's like also for when you feel like you can't walk any further to have that metaphoric feeling of footprints in the sand. You know, God is actually carrying you. I've, I've experienced that. And so, again, I'm glad that that season is over. And I'm glad that even in the word season, we know that seasons have a beginning and an end. And so I'm glad that that is not my season now, and I'm in a different season. And there are challenges that come along with this season too, but this too shall pass. You got married, uh, your, your first marriage was how, how old I was you? 20, I turned 21 the next month. So 20. I got married in December, turned 21 in January. Okay. Oh. Young and dumb, just young hey, and well, dumb. Well, I, 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 my story's the same. So I've been married twice and the first time was about that age. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, yeah, young and dumb. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so take me back to that time. What, what was going through your head? How long were you in that marriage? Okay. Tell me about uh, what it took to get out of it. Okay. I was uh, freshly out of Bible school. I'd gone to Bible school. I was there between the ages of 17 to 19. I'd been out a year, and I thought, hey, I'm on top of the world. I know everything. I love Jesus. Life is good. Plus, plus you had that thing about you went to Bible school, yes. you know what you're supposed to do, how you're supposed to do it. I'm a preacher's kid. So, yeah. So, yeah. You know. <laughs> exactly. You get it. Yes. Yes. And so um, here we are, and, and this guy, I meet him. He's six years older than I was, and I'm thinking, wow, he's a real man. And everyone at... By the way, the, I got to stop you. Okay. My, my ex-wife was six years older than I am. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Similarity. Yeah, right. And so I'm thinking, okay, he invite, you know, he asked me out on a date, on our first date. And I don't want to tell the whole book, but long story short, he proposes to me. And, and I'm feeling 
as if I I don't have the right to say no, because I'm wrestling with the idea of he just said that I was God's best. And so somehow or another, I had stinking thinking that I had caught, not necessarily it was taught to me. It was just caught that there's only one person you can have. And if you miss God's will, you're forever subject to having to experience God's plan B and C and D for you instead of God's plan A. And he's, you know, professing he's God's plan A. And this is of the Lord. And and I'm thinking in my head that I don't really want to get married now. I'm 20, but I don't want to disappoint God. And I'm thinking, well, maybe this is God, because I was thinking that God's will was probably the opposite of what I was desiring, not realizing that he says that if we trust in him, he will give us what to desire. So I, was, I had it kind of backwards. And I thought that God was this big man in the sky who was just a killjoy you know like if you wanted to do something fun he was like no do this instead or you know i want to eat chocolate cake no eat vegetables and nothing wrong with either of them i like both but just that was the it was the wrong perception so i said yes but not now and before i knew it um we were engaged and uh you know several months later we were about to get married and prior to getting married he had hit me the first time and after we said I do, it just was a succession of a lot of different physical beatings and emotional beatdowns as well. And I remember just feeling like, God, like what happened? Like here I was, I loved you, I served you. I um, I went to catechism and you know, the whole nine. And I thought that me growing up in a good home where my parents were married and, and doing all these good things, would anesthetize me from having to experience hardship in life. And that's not how it works. You know, I don't think anybody will leave this earth unscathed. And I don't believe that the true uh, test of life is how much struggle we've had, but how we handle the struggle. I think everybody's going to have something. And I think the real test is how do you see God in the midst of it? Do you change your narrative of God when you're in it? you know, opposed to what it was prior to you getting into it. Is he still good, even when things aren't good? And so that was a, a question I had to wrestle with, you know, that God, you haven't changed, even though my circumstances have changed. And um, so that, it progressed. My heart was, you know, broken and, and God showed up. He gave me peace in the midst of it. He kept me, he surrounded me with different, you know, sister girls. Some of them were going through the exact same thing that I was going through. And they were of all skin shades. They were, you know, from... Uh, Hispanic to Caucasian to biracial to Asian. So I couldn't say it was just a black thing or just a white thing. They were of different economic groups. I couldn't just say it was a poor or middle class or wealthy because everybody spanned the whole thing and everybody was professing to be believers. So I couldn't just say this just happens outside of the church. And I couldn't say it just happened inside of the church. And so um, the fact that God walked with me in the midst of it and proved that he was not afraid of our messes, even the ones that we get ourselves into, and that he does still have a plan. He's able to buy those just disastrous moments and fragmented pieces back from us, and he's able to make a masterpiece out of them is something that he showed me. And so I sit here not because I was smarter than others, not because I was just lucky, but because God's hand was on me and God... Uh, he kept me and he is able to redeem what he is called. And so uh, this is the hope that I share with other people that if if he is if he has shown himself to be able to get me through it and out of it, then he is able to do the same for other people, too, and then use it for their betterment. So your lowest moment, uh, what did you go through and um, how did you finally get out of it? Oh, <sighs> God. <laughs> um, one of my I'll say this one of my lowest moments was uh, I from, and you have to read the book for some of the scenarios and some of the people will be, will have to, but was at the very end when I left and my just, I just felt so defeated. I felt as if like, here I am now. By that time I was 24 because I turned 21 the next month after we had gotten married. And I'm thinking I'm 24, I'm damaged goods, you know? And the first night after I had left for good this time, I slept in my car and I turned on the eight, the heat, sorry, every half an hour, warmed up my car, turned it off to conserve gas. And I remember telling God, saying, God, I just can't do it anymore. Like I know, according to some, I failed. 
Uh, I know according to some, I am probably, you know, on your bad girl list, you know, because I couldn't make it work. And some of them are going to call me, well, she's not a Christian. She's getting divorced and, you know, the whole nine. But I, I just can't do it. And I remember that night just sleeping in the parking lot and uh, still feeling the peace of God, even though inside I was just kind of troubled. But I knew he had me. And then the next morning I went and slept on a friend's. Um, I believe I was on their couch. And then I slept on mattresses on the floor and uh, extra bedrooms and just kind of went from one place to the next. But the Lord got me out and the details I did put in the book as far as like the whole exit. But God kept me and it was hard. You know, it, it was going to be hard to stay. And it was going to be hard to leave. So sometimes you're faced with two hard decisions. And wisdom is which heart is going to lead to life. Because all hearts are not. Every heart scenario. And every heart scenario is not a death scenario either. You know, sometimes you've got to pass through it to get out of it. And so for me, that was, you know, what God actually used. He used a hard season to actually also develop character in me. To develop a love uh, for him that I hadn't had prior to and a trust in him that I didn't know that I needed. And so I see him a lot differently nowadays, nowadays than I did back when I was 17, 18 and 19. I know him as a redeemer, someone who's not just looking for good church girls, but he looks for the bruised, the battered, the mangled, the sinner, the adulterer, the fornicator. He's looking for those people who know that they are messed up, that they are broken and that they're busted and that they're in need of somebody who can fix them and make them better than they were originally. And so that's who I am. And that's who I see him as being. And so I call him my redeemer for a reason because he has saved me and he has bought back those pieces and he's still working things together. He's not done with me. So I'm not, you know, just a masterpiece that's completed. I'm still a work in progress, but I'm sure not the same person I was years ago. And I'm thankful to him for that. So the song itself, obviously this inspired all of that. Mm -hmm. right? Part of it, yes. Part of it, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Tell me the story behind that, what it was like when... when um, when that came to you and you decided, this is it, Yeah. these are the words. Yeah, well, I was sitting in my music room and by this point I had gotten married again, you know, after that first one was over. And I still had a chip on my shoulder with God, though I have to say, I trusted God in a lot of areas and I was so grateful that he had gotten me out of the abusive situation. But if I'm honest, I'd have to say I, I had this thing of, well, God, you didn't protect me from the harm. You didn't keep me from getting, you know, I saved myself for this. And so in the back of my head, I was thinking, I'll trust you and everything else, God. But when it comes to relationships, I got it this time. And so I kind of I, I started uh, compromising in certain values that I'd had prior to. I was like, well, this doesn't really matter. I guess that doesn't matter. I tried it that way and it didn't work. I still got that. So it was as if in the area of, love and relationships, I kind of had my arm out to God saying, you just stay, I'm, I'm going to social distance from you right here, you know, but it was to my peril. And so uh, before I knew it, I was married again, like I said, and things were happening in my marriage that were heartbreaking. And I remember crying out to God saying, God, I I've forgiven and it, things aren't changing. I don't know what to do. I don't want to get a divorce because I've been divorced already. And I just felt like I was just in a pit, you know, and I, I didn't know how to get out. And so sometimes it's not a get out, it's a look up, you know, to change your view. And so one day I was sitting in my music room at home and I began to read the book of Job. And I know we hear about the woes and the troubles of Job, but it's a really, fa it's a fascinating book if you haven't read it. And it starts out with this conversation between God and the devil, which I didn't know happened in the real story. And uh, God pretty much baits the devil saying, well, Job is perfect, you know, and the devil's like, yeah, he's only perfect. And he has all this stuff because you've given him all this stuff. Like you're like Santa Claus to him, basically. And the devil's like, but if you lift this hedge of protection that you have around Job and pretty much you let me get him, I promise you he's going to curse you to your face because he's saying Job can't handle disasters he can't handle the re reality of life that we all experience he's in a bubble 
So God was like, yeah, bets on. Do whatever you want to do, but you can't touch Job. So long story short, you may know this, but the devil comes, he kills all of his kids, Job's kids in one day, all 10 of them. He takes away his wealth. Eventually he takes away his health. He uh, has his friends turning on him. Like Job's world is turned upside down. He goes from being the superstar to the, the beggar, basically, that no one wants to be around. And he's sitting there and he's depressed and he has woe is me songs going on. And his friends are coming from out of town and they're telling him, Job, you must have done something wrong. You must have cursed God. Not knowing that God has said about Job, Job was blameless. Like Job was one of God's like favorites if he's allowed to have favorites. So it would seem according to scripture. Well, in the midst of it, Job is sitting there and he doesn't know what we know. Now we can read the end of the book and we can see, okay, eventually God turns the tide for Job again. He gets 10 more kids. He gets, I don't know if he gets married again or not, but he gets, you know, he has twice as much wealth given to him. His health is restored, longer life on the back end, yada, yada, yada. He gets the happily ever after. But it was in the middle before the end came that Job actually made this statement of faith. Basically, when he was still infirmed and he's still depressed and everything else, he was like, he had a moment of clarity and he was saying, I wish somebody would write this down. Oh, if this right here was written down in a book and he begins to like speak hope against a hopeless situation. And he says, basically, I don't know what's going on, but I do know that my redeemer lives. And in the last day, he's going to stand upon the earth. And Job says, and though my body be destroyed in my flesh, I'm going to see God. And so after reading what Job had said, he was basically saying the one who's going to buy back my pain and shame. He's alive and he is well, and he's going to change this thing for me. I don't know how, I don't know when, but I know that he's going to do it. So after I read it that day, I remember thinking, man, if Job can speak these words in the midst of his heartache, in the midst of his dire situation, how much more can I? When I haven't gone through but a fraction of what he's, he's endured. And so I began to pick up my little guitar I didn't play very well and I still don't play very well, but I began to strum some chords and a melody came. And before I knew it, I was singing, you know, I know my Redeemer lives. I know my Redeemer, he lives. All of creation testifies this life within me cries I know my Redeemer lives and then I began to write a first verse and then the words left me and it took me a whole nother year to finish the second verse on the, the bridge. But in that whole year of even writing that song, it became my comfort song in the midst of what I was going through. It was a song that I sang to myself to encourage myself and remind myself that today wasn't always going to be what my tomorrows were going to look like. And so it, it just became my hope. And so I remember strumming it and singing it to myself, never knowing that eventually God was going to use it to take it around the world, to, to take it through decades, to encourage other people in their journeys as well. And so uh, a song was born and a life was changed by a song. Wow. So you have a thing for uh, starting something and, and taking a while to complete it, don't you? Yes, I'm slow. I'm <laughs> deliberate, not slow. That's deliberate. good. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so here you are. You uh, have been married twice. Yes. Now, you're not going for a Mickey Rooney kind of thing, are you? You're, you're, ah, <laughs> what? <laughs> wait, what? Yes, eight. What? No. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> No, look, my next love will be my last love. There you go. Yes, yes, the last. Or I'll just, it'll just be me and Jesus, if not, you know. But I, I believe that there's redemption for me in the area of love as well. I was married the second time for 21 years. Mm -hmm. I did not want to be divorced again. I believe marriage should be forever. Uh, but I also believe that it takes two people for to make a marriage work. It takes That's one right. person to get divorced, but two to make it work. And so I am uh, a lot wiser than I was initially. Did I, I, did I, I? Yeah, a lot stronger now and uh, a little more clear, a lot more clear as to what I want and uh, what it'll take. So for, what do you want? Whew, 
well, <laughs> <laughs> if I say it now, if I, I might get too many email messages. No. Well, it's someone honestly who loves the Lord definitely is a must. Someone who is faithful, someone who not only loves Jesus, but who is committed to loving me and covering me. I um, I have three children, so there are certain things that are a desire in that area. Uh, you got to have your own money, of course. I can't support no other man. I'm just saying, I've been there, done that. <laughs> got the t-shirt to prove it. <laughs> anyway, but uh, there's, yeah, there's, I have other things on my list, but I've been encouraged this week really to just even rip up my list and say, okay, God, I want what you want and who you want. You know, and, and so, somebody you can you can uh, stand uh, to be in a quarantine with. Yes, and you can't do that with everybody. No, everybody doesn't qualify for that one right there. So yes, and you know I'm a country girl on one hand, and uh, but I also like people. But I'm probably more of an extroverted introvert, so I do enjoy my own space. Mm-hmm. And uh, the the danger is, I will say this: the longer that I am single the more I'm enjoying it, Mm -hmm. you know? And so I'm starting to see that I can get, I'm getting a little settled in my ways and it's going to take that special person to really make me want to compromise on some of those things that I'm now getting used to. Hey, I I had... uh, Understood. (laughs) I I totally understand. And I will tell you, just this whole quarantine over the last couple of months, Mm -hmm. the first couple of weeks, I was like, I don't know if I can handle this. Yeah. I just don't know if I can handle this, mm-hmm. okay? I, I needed to like reach out and touch someone, yeah. right? And now you're like, okay. <laughs> and then I get about two weeks into it, and I'm like, you know, I don't... Not so bad. <laughs> it's not so bad. And then I discovered the walking yeah. thing. Yeah. And I, like yeah. I mentioned before, I started at three miles a day, and now I'm up to like eight miles a day, wow. which is like this just this crazy time, me, God, nature podcast yeah calling my, my mom my dad yeah. friends whoever for 20 minutes as you're walking as i'm walking That's fantastic now i'm like walking on air wow after walking all these miles for all these weeks yeah and i'm like yeah you know what i don't think i really need to go out yeah it, it doesn't I, yeah. I don't feel it yeah so that'll be our adjustment on the other end. Now, by the way, if we yeah. get into the fall, and if I don't have my Ohio State games, I, I, I may, I may, <laughs> that may be different. <laughs> like, no, okay, time up, time up. <laughs> I get you. That's something, though. So, how are your kids? You know, I, I know that I used to see your daughter at Starbucks. She worked at Starbucks years ago, right? She did, and then at Highbrow, and now she's a part of a band, The New Respects, uh-huh. the lead singer of that, and they were touring like a lot. They did Bonnaroo and Lollapalooza, like all kinds of you know uh festivals and stuff and so she's done well she's still writing and of course they're off the road as all of us are right now but yeah she's done very well she's done well yeah so what is it going to be like if you cannot go back on the road for the next you know umpteen months or year how would you let, let me put it this way, as an artist, as a musician, as someone who is uh, touring, let's just say you can't tour, how would you propose to reinvent yourself? Okay, well, I've been working on that uh, even prior to this. For the past probably year or two, I've been doing a whole lot more speaking engagements, even than just singing in concerts. And so we're talking about doing different webinars and uh, just how to uh, things that we have learned from our industry, uh, selling knowledge in that way or just encouraging people. So we're doing that. Uh, Of course, I'm writing books. I still have more books in me. So that's another avenue. There are other things that I enjoy that I want to uh, explore and I, because I believe that we're all called to have at least seven avenues of revenue and then things that we do that may not uh, have monetary gain for us, but they may yield dividends in other ways. And so I'm working on those different things as creative investments. And so 
that's a whole nother other. But uh, there are things that I like to do that I'm working on to get out there. And so communicating is what I do. So whether we do that online through Zoom or through uh, just different webinars, like I said, or in print, those, those are avenues that we're still uh, that are still accessible to us. And you can do home concerts. So we're talking about doing, you know, a home concert or just whenever I get online and I pick up my little guitar at times and play badly like I do and sing, it's kind of some of our highest viewed uh, just lives that we have. And I don't do it enough. Oh, I, I see but, on Facebook every once in a while doing yeah. like a, a devotion each day. Yes, yes, right? yes, yeah. yes. I need to get back to that right. more consistently. In, in the car, in the car. Yes, usually. I've done, yes, yes. <laughs> ah, you know, yes. So I need to do that more consistently. But there are different avenues out there for us. And um, I, I know God will continue to open up other doors. So I'm not really worried. I'm like, okay, Lord, you have brought me and a lot of us this far. You know how to sustain us and to keep us. And I believe also that we do have to change some things. So it may not look like it looked, you know, five months ago. The things that may be the things that we uh, sustain ourselves with may change. And that's okay, you know. But I think the truth of what we give out, the message of what we present, I believe those things are evergreen. It's just the methods that will change. And that's okay. So I'm open to what those new methods might be. And in the meantime, those that I do know of, I'm planning on, you know, just taking advantage of those avenues as well. It's an exciting time to be a communicator. Yeah. The age of the uh, gatekeeper has ended. Yes. I'm amazed at all of these shows where, you know, people are anchoring the news or doing whatever they're doing from home. Yeah. Of course, we're all trying to read the books on their bookshelf. Uh -huh. but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you can get kind of clever by throwing people off by yeah. putting on yeah. books that, like, I, I had no idea. <laughs> I had no idea. I, I thought that was a raging lib or a raging, you know, red state guy or what do you mean he's reading that book or she's doing that? Yes. You know, it's, it's like, the thing of it is, is that, we are in a in a day in a place in a time where you can go live mm -hmm. you, you you can reach millions of people anybody can i mean mm -hmm. just i mean we've been doing the keep faith radio show for years literally on the cloud wow. with our folks our production folks spread all over the country i haven't even met half of my staff in 9 years wow okay um we have syndicated it via the internet there's no towers there's no wow. buildings there's no so we were kind of ready for this mm -hmm. okay we didn't have to like make all these crazy changes and then the then the whole podcast thing i mean that is just, that, that mm -hmm. that's yeah changed the world and turned it upside down yes i mean the fact that keep the faith is so successful in that space in the christian radio space is one thing but the fact that the, our podcast is in the top 20 of iheart's spirituality you know and we're not even an iheart radio station you know it's wow. it's it the fact that you can do this from your like basement yeah with a couple of microphones yeah right yes it's amazing it's just crazy yes my sister girl Karen's working on her podcast too, Are encouraging you really? me to do my yes, so yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes. So it's good. So it's like you were saying, everybody can do like anybody, not anybody, but everybody has access to doing it these days. You and, really have no yeah. excuse yeah. to say, well, if only. I still go into a lot of colleges and speak, and when I go in, and I have it right on the other side of the door, I, I take in a bell, and well, let me put it this way: I talk to all these. 18, 19, 20 year olds yeah. in communication classes. Mm -hmm. They tell me their dreams and how they want to make movies and this and that. And, and uh, I said, well, what's stopping you? Well, you know, I just don't know if anybody will this and that. And I'm like, first of all, I pull out my Bell and Hal camera from the 1970s, mm -hmm. which is a 16 millimeter camera before videotape, by wow. the way. And I pass that around the class and it weighs about, I don't know, 30 pounds. And I said, do you realize that this is what I started with? And they go, man, you're really old. <laughs> <laughs> Seasoned. <laughs> but, but I say, this is what I started out with. And I said, I got two and a half minutes of film out of shooting off this camera. Wow. I, and I had to shoot it, take it back to the station, process it, edit it, 
with a razor blade and cement. Wow. You know? uh, and, and I paint this picture of how difficult it was. And I said, do you realize, and I hold up my phone, in their case, an iPhone, do you realize you can shoot unlimited amount of HD video on this? Yeah. You can edit on this. You can underscore on this. Mm -hmm. You can upload and have worldwide distribution on this. So you people have no excuse whatsoever. Yeah. None. None. Zero. None. All while <laughs> eating a Chick-fil-A sandwich. I'm just saying, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. You do have to have the the uh, the ideas. True. Content. True. Yeah. And, and you've got to know how to tell a great story. Yeah. I think that was the one thing that I learned by shooting on film back mm -hmm. in the beginning and only having two and a half minutes to, to work with, I had to I had to think out every shot in my head. You know, I couldn't shoot for hours on end, you know, like you yeah. can now with a phone, yeah. right? Yeah. Hey, I think you should go for it. Do the podcast, do the thing from the bunker, you know, the yeah. the, the YouTube thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's so much yeah. you can do and you'd reach millions of people and who cares about the gatekeepers? True. True. Do do you have gatekeepers now? Um, some, but not as many as before. No. Like yeah. uh, like uh, on nope. the on the music side, are you with? No, a, I'm independent. Good for you, and I love it. Good for you. I really you. do love it. Yeah, I was telling my son about that last night. He's 17, and he is, you know, an up and coming artist. He writes, he produces, and he was like, "Mom, what advice would you give to somebody like me just starting out?" And so we were talking about the old days. And I was like, back when I came out, we had the cassette and we had, and the CD was new. So we're talking about even, even industry standards and contracts and the pros and the cons and, you know, that whole thing there. So um, things have changed and I'm planning on taking advantage of what is now, you know, I can't go backwards, but I can take advantage of what is now to propel myself forward into, you know, what it should be. And so I don't have the same gatekeepers and I'm happy about it. You know, I was telling my uh, folks, we, we've decided beginning later this summer, I explained this whole coronavirus thing as, as follows. Three months ago, we all had a toolbox mm -hmm. and the toolbox was pretty full. Yeah. You know, we, we, we thought we had it together. We had gigs, we had jobs, yeah. we had, we had money uh, coming money in, coming in, coming both in sides, the, yeah. the whole thing, right? Yeah. Then all of a sudden, we, we, we go to bed one night, and somebody by the name of Corona comes in and steals all the tools out of the toolbox. Yeah. Our hammer, our screwdriver, saw everything. has gone, right? Yeah. And I think our job is to help people, encourage people, and to give people back those tools yeah. um, beginning in the next few months yeah because this is this this may take a year or two years or three mm -hmm. years or whatever to recover this is not going to be you know we're, we're going to have Overnight. easter together yeah. right i mean it's th no this yeah. is going to be like a long-term thing mm -hmm. because there's just been so much lost and i see all these companies going bankrupt and yeah. i see uh all of these uh, just the, the tremendous change in all these different industries yeah. right yeah so we've really decided look Let's focus in on giving people the ability to get those tools back. Yeah. And let's bring on people to inspire them. And like I had, uh, you know, Patrice Washington. She is like America's money maven. Okay. Uh, she is amazing. You got to check her out at patricewashington.com. Okay. And I had her a couple of days ago, and she has an amazing story where she had this unbelievable real estate empire. And then lost it all in two thousand after two thousand eight, wow. and and she ended up going from a six thousand square foot house and the Mercedes and the whole thing with her husband down to a little apartment, and he went to work for Taco Bell. Gotcha! Wow! And okay. now she's she's built it back up. Wow! She decided to go out and inspire folks mm -hmm. and uh, light a fire under them, and she is just amazing. So at any rate, we have these amazing people on. Uh, Tim wow. Story. I don't know if you know yeah, Tim yeah, Story. Yeah, Tim's yeah. a good buddy of mine. Yeah. Have him on. So we're we're just gonna light people up. But you yes. know what? I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna challenge you now. All right, please do. Come on. I have never actually had an angelic, triumphant, bigger than life theme song for Keep the Faith. And I think of one time in America right now we need something to bring mm -hmm. us out of this mm -hmm. because it's more than ever 
We've yeah. got to keep the faith now. Yeah. We really have to. Yeah. I, I just believe that mm-hmm. uh, America has, has got to get it back. Yeah. You know, we can't do it ourselves. No. We can't do it ourselves. No. So, hey, if you yeah. got it in you, if you got it in you. All right. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> Still there. It's still there. <laughs> I well, you know, really quickly, too, I want to say is that a part of my book, too, and I'm not going to go too far backwards, is talks about Betsy Smith. I don't know if you remember Betsy Smith from back in the day. She was the first. She was the empress of blues, and she was my grandmother's cousin, first cousin. And then. Wait, wait, wait. You had a lot of first cousins because I just. I, yeah. Somebody told me Little Richard, Richard was, was my your dad's, dad's first, first cousin. cousin. Yes. Uh, and so, yes. And so <laughs> my point is they've written their own songs, you know. Yeah. of what they've been going what they were going through and God gave them success in their own air. But I'm cla- I was so glad even though I have not had their same success as little Richard or as Bessie Smith. But he's given me success where he's called me to be able to deliver songs of hope for people, songs of deliverance, songs of redemption, songs of encouragement. And I pray that, you know, he would take what I've already written and continue to bless people and that he would continue to give me more songs of deliverance and songs of hope to continue to do that as a continuation of a legacy that may not have all started in redemptive work but that will end in redemptive work for his glory and for the good of other people. So just had to throw that in there. I think you've got many great songs in you, mm-hmm. left in you. Thank you. And I think you have something that is probably, uh, why don't you do more television? Why don't you do more video? I would love to. I need to. Don't say a word over there. Oh, no, 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 no. She's like, I've been telling her that. (laughs) (laughs) But she doesn't listen to me. Going to say. You know why I have an eye for these things. All right. No, I was in the television business for 30 years. Oh, wow. Yeah, I launched three little shows. Wheel of Fortune, Jeopardy, and the Oprah (gasps) Winfrey Show. Really? Yeah. I, I, oh, so I you did know have these a, things. I did have a life before this. You know these things. Well, maybe you need to give me some tips. You guys hear this? He needs to give me some tips, okay? All right. Well, the tip number one is be yourself, and I don't think you have any problem doing that. True. <laughs> True this. I mean, just, just this book, mm. just this book where you really put it out there. Yeah. We need more of this. We we need we need more of this because uh, I think authenticity is the greatest currency there is. I agree, I agree, yeah. And that's what I was telling my son last night when it was all said and done. That very thing right there, you can't you can't imitate it. There's no substitute for it, and it's so needed these days because everybody can spot the fakes, and we've had enough of it. So authenticity, vulnerability. I believe is what is required. And honestly, I don't know how to live and communicate without it. I think it's just a part of who I am and who we're called to be, honestly. So what you see is pretty much what you get. Yeah, and hopefully what you get is worth having. So as we come out on the other side of all this in the next uh, few months, as we are most likely going to look at things a little differently i just don't see how we can go back to where we were before and and by the way i i really do believe this is going to go on for a couple of years yeah okay i mean At least maybe, the effects of maybe it. not on this level mm-hmm. but the effects i agree and there could be a second wave a third wave all yeah. that i mean look i always tell people and my friends around the country that we really here in Williamson County live in a bubble. Yeah. I mean, we're driving around. We're, J. Alexander's is open and Chick fil A's yes. open. <laughs> like, uh, tomorrow, by the way, I know you really admire my hair. Loving it. <laughs> I'm getting a haircut tomorrow. <laughs> nah, it looks great, though. It, look, it looks great. Yeah. Just, 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 yes. but, but, you know, we're in a bubble. I've yeah. got my friends out in LA and they're like in prison. In New York, I know as well. Yeah. I think this Friday they have. Um, um, Stage one. Stage one. Yeah, of phase you, one, yeah. Uh, whatever, you can uh, have uh, curbside pickup. Oh. And I think we've always had that, haven't we? Haven't we had- Yikes, that's their phase one. Yeah. Really? I mean, I I mean, Denise and I have had, uh, oh, here at the office, we've had lunch delivered here so, yeah. 10 times yeah, yeah, in the last yeah. few weeks from, yeah. uh, you know what, Red Robin. Okay. 
when you go there in the old days and order something, you'd wait 45 minutes. And now? Somehow or another, it gets here in 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> like we have the customers now. Oh, I'm like, sorry, Red Robin. <laughs> but that's good. Good for the patron. I'm like, will I ever go out again? <laughs> Yikes. And, yeah, that's the new normal. So, yeah, yeah. We're, we're living in this bubble, and we've been living in it for some time. But uh, as we come out of this and go into the new norm, mm-hmm. okay, how do you see your life being impacted and, and uh, changed? Well, I, I believe I I pray that I will be uh, a lot more appreciative for just the the simple things, you know, just having my kids around, you know, that I don't lose that um, joy in just the things that we take for granted and having my mom and appreciating, you know, those that I get a chance to see and interact with, the hugs that you're able to give again. Um, I pray that that would be something that will travel with me. And the fact, too, that God was able to keep us. You know, if we survive this thing, we all have testimonies. We all have a story to tell, you know, and enough of it will be that Things were one way and they were horrible and they were bad, but we've been sustained through it. And so I pray that that will be something that I will continue to remind people of, not just in my life, but to take inventory in their lives as well, regardless of if it's me singing a song or in front of a video or me writing a book or whatever it might be. But that will be a part of my story and encouraging people to tell it in theirs. Well, Nicole, it's been fun. Oh, yeah. back at you as always. Yeah, <laughs> this has you. been this has been fun. <laughs> Next time, I hope to give you a hug. I know, you? I hate that. <laughs> that's, that's like the downside of this whole thing. You can't hug everybody you see and the whole nine. But it's been a pleasure. Uh, best wishes uh, on the on the book. It's available on Amazon.com. Yes, and wherever you used to get books. Yes, and NicoleCMullen.com on my website. If you'd like to have an autographed copy. I, I don't think there is yes. a bookstore anymore. Is there? I, I mean, know. It, I said, you, you know, yeah, why bother? Honestly. You can't go into Barnes & no, Noble that I know no. of. No. I, I, that's why I said Amazon.com or you can get it off my website if you want an autographed copy because you can't go into a bookstore right now. So. Do you guys go down to uh, the uh, post office and ship these books like every Friday or something? What? <laughs> no. I put them actually in my mailbox because I live out in the country. Oh, yeah. In the mailbox, as many as I can get in there with the check. And they mail them for me. Wow. And give me the receipt the next day. Sure do. That is like, pretty we, cool. But we've gone to the post office and we've taken a shipload of books. <laughs> and they were so mad at us. So, so mad at us because we had so many books and it was toward the end of the day and it took quite a while. So now I just put them across the street from my home. <laughs> Good for you. Good for you. Well, thanks for stopping by and being our guinea pig. Thank you. As uh, guest number one. <laughs> Coming out of phase one of the uh, quarantine. Yes. Everybody else will love it. So when you invite them, they should come. It's clean, it's sanitized, and social distanced. Fantastic. (laughs) Thank you so much. Thank you. So thank you, Nicole, for stopping by. We really, really appreciate it. You've been listening to CIA, Contagious Influencers of America, the podcast from the producers of Keep the Faith. And be sure to check out our new YouTube channel. It's actually called keepthefaith.com. Like if you were typing in a uh, web address, we've done that on YouTube. And you're going to find all these incredible videos featuring our th- our shows, you know, our themed shows like weathering the storm and, uh, you know, o- overcoming fear, you know, things that you're going through right now. We have created specific hours featuring songs and stories to help you get through, push through whatever it is you're dealing with. So check it out on YouTube, the keepthefaith.com channel. And please do remember to rate and review this podcast. It's the only way that others can uh, learn of it. You sure would help us out if you do that. That's it for this edition of CIA Contagious Influencers of America, the podcast. Remember to go out there and live that life in living color because it sure is a heck of a lot more interesting than living in black and white. See you next time.